Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. And in this video, we're gonna be taking a closer look at how to beat a serve and volleyer. This is part two of a series. We did part one a few weeks ago on baseline tactics. So if you enjoyed that video, I think you'll really enjoy this video as well. The footage was provided by EssentialTennis.com. If you wanna see that full stats and 3D analysis breakdown, stay tuned because it's coming up next. The first thing we want to do is a little stats breakdown before we get into the 3D analysis. Now, one thing we noticed in the first set of this match is that Ian won 90% of the points that he played where he came into the net. In the second set though, things really started to change. Kevin started to get more comfortable at the baseline and Ian felt like he had to serve and volley and had to come into the net. There was a clear shift in who had the advantage from the baseline. It shifted toward Kevin's favor and Ian came to the net 25 times in the second set compared to just 10 in the first set. In the first set, we said Ian won 90% of his net points. In the second set, he won 60%. So why did he win, you know, still more than 50% of his net points, but not as many as he won in the first set? Again, that has to do with how Kevin played, and we're about to break that down for you with our 3D analysis. Kevin's stats in the first set from the baseline were not very pretty. He had four winners with 19 unforced errors in the first set. He started to tighten things up, started to get more consistent, get more depth on his shot, and started to do more damage. He incensed this, he felt the shift, he knew he had to come in more than 10 times in the second set. One of the most important things in terms of beating a certain volleyer is understanding what height of ball you're giving them. So so what I like to do is break down contact height on a player into four different sections. And those four sections are foot to knee height is where we're making contact with balls. That's the first section that we have. The second section that we have is knee to hip. The third zone or contact height is going to be from that waist height up to your shoulder. That's another area where we can make in contact. You can see on this particular return of serve, Kevin's making contact between his waist and his shoulder. The final contact height and zone that we have is the fourth one, and that's above the shoulder. So anything up here is gonna be considered to be the fourth contact height or zone. The first mistake that we see Kevin make off this serve, and I like the serve up the T to the backhand here, but the first move and mistake we see is Kevin's positioning isn't that close to the baseline, and then even with that positioning, he gives up his ground to move a little bit diagonally backwards here to receive the return. Now, what's wrong with that thought process? When you're playing a good serve and volleyer, the last thing you want to do is potentially pop balls up that they can hit in the higher contact zones. We don't want them hitting volleys from waist to shoulder height or shoulder and above. We want to see you know, waist to knee and preferably knee to foot contact heights. It's gonna to be tough to do that when we're playing from so far back and we're letting balls drop into our contacts. So we'll just go back one more time. We can see the peak of this ball is definitely well above Kevin's shoulder. Now I'm not saying he should hit it at that particular contact height, but what he lets happen is he lets it really drop into this particular contact height here. He's hitting a slice return. So a couple of things are probably gonna happen in this scenario. He's probably going to float the return up and then provide Ian with a very friendly contact height to hurt him on the next ball. Let's see what happens with this ball. It floats up and Ian gets sort of the ideal contact height here for a first volley. The first thing that we've noticed, Ian has not had to move at all left or right to this ball. He hasn't had to move at all, right? And the second thing that we notice is that contact height being elevated, being up higher. And that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid this, and we want to avoid scenarios where we haven't moved them at all left or right. Ian has taken essentially a straight line right to the net. He's moved about 18 feet, which is the distance from the baseline to the service line. It's actually 18 feet. He's barely had to move off of that line at all. This is the easiest volley he could possibly have in this scenario. And really what we have for Ian from this position is we have this above shoulder contact height. He's got every option in the world that he could possibly want. He can drive the ball deep to this corner, drive it deep to this corner, drop volley here, drop volley here. He's got everything basically open to him. Big targets, small targets, doesn't matter. He has all the options in the world. The mistake that Kevin makes here as well is look at Kevin's movement pattern. He kind of originally faded back here a little bit on the line and diagonally moved back on the return, but now he's moving into the court or closer to the baseline and getting himself in the center when he should be backing up in the center, right? He shouldn't be moving into this because he should be anticipating Ian being really aggressive with this shot. So he's got a huge movement pattern mistake here. I wanna see him fade back into this area off of a ball 
where Ian's going to get really aggressive, right? He needs to be recognizing this at this point and seeing that Ian's going to punish him and that he needs to be backing up to cover a ball here or cover a ball here. Let's see what happens with his next shot. Ian drives it to the corner, right? Takes that safe, big target, really aggressive. And now Kevin decides he's going to back up. But we wanted him to back up earlier so he doesn't have to make this defensive move right away, anticipating that aggressive shot, right? And we see the lob fades off to the side. Now you might say, well, Jason, Ian had more options than just hitting deep, and he does. But I'll say this, unless you're a professional tennis player or a very high-level player, dropping the ball short here, drop shots, is a lower percentage play than just taking it and driving it here. That's why I want to see Kevin backing up instead of moving forward. I don't want to see him moving forward for that lower percentage possibility, especially because I think Kevin moves extremely well and it would be relatively easy unless Ian hits an amazing drop shot for Kevin to actually cover that drop shot, right? So for the second 3D analysis point, we've got Ian on the near side of the court here, right? Getting ready to serve and we got Kevin on the far side and let's see what happens. Ian serves T again. The first thing that we see with Kevin, though, is as he goes to hit the return, it's tough to tell from back here, he's fading away and back towards the curtain to hit this return, right? What I do like with Kevin here is he's going to hit a topspin return, but we can see the contact point might be a little bit low, right? We know that if we're taking it a little lower and letting it drop, we're giving Ian here more time to close the net and get a better first volley contact than he would have, right? We know that that's happening. So Kevin fades back. He does come topspin here. Low contact point lets Ian get tighter to the net. Let's see what happens, though. Now, what Kevin really did well here and what was tough from his position was he moved Ian more left and right. We can see Ian's total movement to the first ball is about two and a half feet more for his first contact than it was in the previous point. And we see this zigzag pattern with Ian where he has had to move all over the court to hit the first volley. It's a lot different and a lot more difficult than the uh, the first point we saw. And besides moving Ian more on this second point than he did in the first point already, we can also see that Ian's balance here is a little bit off. So going to hit that ball, yes, Ian's still getting a ball that's around waist height, at least it's not above the shoulder, right? But it's more waist height. But we can see Ian's body position here. He's a little off balance. And you can see that by the way that he's leaning forward here with his back. And he's also sort of lunging at this ball a little bit. So as this plays forward, we're going to kind of take this frame by frame. You can see as well here that Ian is off balance after the contact, right? Because Kevin forced him to move a little bit more. No, the contact wasn't down at the feet where we really want it. It was a little bit more at the waist height. But at least he made Ian move a little more. He made the volley more difficult than before. Let's see how Ian handles this volley though and see you know, what he does with it. Really smart from Ian. So Ian recognizes as well, hey, I'm a little off balance in this position. I need to play my volley a little bit more conservatively. He doesn't go for a small target you know, in one of the corners here. He elects to play safe and deep a little bit more up the middle. And we see this mistake that Kevin makes here. What I really want Kevin to do is recognize that he's hurt Ian and then he's got him off balance here and not to back up so much on the next shot. Hold your ground a little bit more. Keep Ian off balance like this and don't let Ian close the net so tight after this volley, right? But Kevin backs up and runs around his backhand here to hit an inside out forehand from a very low contact point. I'm not sure why he elected to do this, but he just gave Ian a lot of time to close the net and make the pass more difficult potentially for Kevin. So. Kevin backs up a ton here. He didn't need to do this. Runs around to hit a forehand. He's off balance off of his back foot, and he's way behind the baseline. And he didn't need to move that far back. And then he sprays the pass long and wide, right? Let's move on to the third 3D analysis point now and see how this continues to progress. All right, so now we have the third 3D analysis point. We have Ian serving from the far side. We've got our movement tracker on both of our players, and we can see Kevin here on the near side. The first difference we already see from our previous points is we see Kevin is much closer to the baseline, right? He's got a position closer here. He's starting to realize that he needs to play closer to take Ian's time away. So Ian's not hitting his first volley from inside the service line and getting too close to the net. Kevin needs to shorten up that time and make sure Ian's not as comfortable. Let's see what happens here. Ian goes down the tee again. I think that's his favorite serve on the deuce side to Kevin's backhand. I don't necessarily like Kevin's movement to this ball. We can see he starts forward. He kind of fades a little diagonally back here to hit this first return of serve. 
I will say this, decent contact height from Kevin. It's a little higher, closer to shoulder height. And I love the fact that Kevin is going low to high and that he's going to hit a top spin backhand return to serve again. That's a second point in a row we've seen that instead of slicing it and possibly fading it up, right? So he comes over it, and he does a good job, a better job here of dipping it. And what we see is we talked about those four contact heights, right? Now we see a little bit more of that knee to hip contact height on this first ball volley for Ian. We can also see that Ian has had to move a lot more to hit this again, 22.7 feet this time making contact. So he's moving more, which you know can throw off his balance, put him in a tougher position. Ian takes this, does a very good job of handling this ball. We can see this here, very good, deep to the middle, pretty conservative. And Ian's target is conservative because of the situation that he's in, right? He's off balance. Kevin has hit a good quality return, and Ian needs to play this safe. It makes no sense to go small target here, here, and make an unforced error from this position. We also see with Kevin that he's in the center of Ian's best two possible shots. He's in the right recovery position this time, and he's moved you know, kind of forward a little bit, anticipating a potential short ball somewhere in here. Let's see, though, what Ian does with it. Ian does a very good job of getting this ball deep, and what Kevin does is Kevin backs up a little bit too much here for my liking. Really backs up diagonally to his left here, lets the ball drop a lot, but I like the fact that you can see Kevin coming over the ball again. He's gonna hit some type of topspin, and based on his body position here, it definitely looks like the way the body is positioned back, he's going topspin lob. This is not something that he did very much in the match, but it looks like he's gonna hit a topspin lob here, and he needed to hit more lobs in this match to keep Ian honest. It's not something he went to very much, especially in the first set. He did pull a few out in the second set, and we can see that he does it right there. Now, let's go back a little bit. He hits a topspin lob. Ian's moved, you know, about 32 feet to this point. Ian starts to recognize here off of Kevin's racket position and his body position. I think he's recognizing the lob is coming. So let's see what happens. He goes back to hit it. Ian had to move about 13 to 14 feet back just to hit this lob. He's in a very, very off-balance position. Kevin has done damage with a shot that we don't often think of people doing damage with. We usually think of people hurting their opponent or doing damage with really aggressive, you know, hard shots, serves, whatever. This is a topspin lob, and he's damaging Ian. You can see Ian's body and balance position is really off here, and Kevin should now be anticipating the ability to move inside the court and receive a really weak ball. Let's see what happens. Ian flubs that up a little bit short. It lands inside zone two here in the shorter part of the court. Kevin takes the time to move around here and go for a forehand. You can tell Kevin's hitting an inside in forehand by two things that kind of give this away. Contact points a little further back, right? And look at how open this hip is. This indicates to me he's going somewhere around here on this particular shot. Hits it nice and deep in zone three. He's got Ian lunging at the ball and Ian's forced into the air down the line. Now, let's look at two other quick things in this particular point really fast. And this comes into recognizing your opponent's fatigue, right? You can see the score line here. We're deep in the second set. They've played a really tight second set, a lot of points, a lot of movement. And you can see Ian's move back to this ball is, you know, he's struggling with it a little bit. Kevin should be recognizing that Ian is fading physically and that he's got him fatigued and that playing some longer points now isn't a bad idea. So you can see Ian kind of back here struggling with this ball. Then we see Kevin step around again, get really aggressive with this. And Ian here, you can see the big lunge that he takes with his feet, right? Huge lunge here instead of a few more steps to that ball. And a poor balance position, again, indicates fatigue in the second set. Kevin should be hungry here to play a third set. I know they didn't play a third set in this match, but he should be hungry to play a third, knowing his opponent is fatigued and seeing those body cues. You can even see it after Ian makes contact with the ball. He's not just disappointed with you know the outcome of this point. Look at how weak that position is and his body position is after he makes contact with the ball. The cues tell you he's tired. But again, it's really important to remember in this third point, it all started with Kevin's position closer to the baseline, right? And then the second thing that really helped him here was coming over the ball with topspin and having a little higher contact point, which made it easier for him to dip the ball down at Ian's feet. Remember, 
so many of these points, the choices that you make, it's how you start the point. Obviously, finishing is extremely important, but starting the right way sets things up for what could happen later in the point. And in the fourth point, we start to see Kevin really put things together. So a couple things we're gonna notice right off the bat. Ian really likes that T-serve, right? He really hits that well. Kevin, though, you can see his footwork movement pattern here. He moves in and does a good job moving inside and closer to the baseline, right? And then again, we see Kevin going with the topspin backhand return. So he decides he's going to come low to high, not slice this. And he's got a pretty good contact height here. He's not hitting it at waist height. You can see Ian charging in, getting ready for that first volley. Kevin does an amazing job here of rolling this and getting it down at Ian's feet. So this is the first time that we're seeing Ian having to deal with the ball at his feet, that foot to knee height, instead of that waist height and above, right? This is the ideal contact height that we wanna force a serve and volleyer into. We don't wanna be giving them balls that are really high and elevated, right? The other thing we notice about this, is tough to tell from this angle, but this ball looks to be almost behind Ian's front foot. So that means he's hitting it from behind him. He's gonna to have to scoop this up Top spin on this little half volley, and then he's having to hit it from foot height. Kevin has already anticipated this a little bit, and he's moving inside or closer to the baseline, which he should based on the body cues that we see from Ian right here. We can also notice that movement-wise, Ian has moved again more than 18 feet, right? More than a direct straight line. That combination with the low contact height makes this extremely difficult to hit and handle. Let's see what happens. Kevin did anticipate again, the short reply from Ian or the short half volley, he moves in right away before it's even struck. And then Kevin's got a really good position here inside zone three, right? Kevin's moving forward. He's very balanced. The contact's maybe a little low around waist height, but Ian is exactly where he's supposed to be based on the shot that he hit. If you hit to the middle third of the court in here, you should be recovered directly in the middle third on the other side of the court. That's where Ian is. But what makes that difficult for Ian is if Kevin goes here or here, Ian's going to have to move a lot to receive these balls, right? He's going to have to move a pretty far distance, especially for a volley where Kevin is aggressively moving inside the court. Let's see what happens with the ball. Kevin forces Ian into this lunging volley, and you can see he's fully stretched out. Kevin did not have to hit a small target, and he didn't here. He hit a, you know, a pretty conservative big target. He's receiving a weak ball. He's getting it inside the court in zone three, and Ian's in a very difficult position, not the position he wants to be in. And then Kevin is able to force the air. But it all started back at the beginning, right? We saw much better things from Kevin position-wise, and we saw much better things from Kevin shot selection-wise. What Kevin basically did with this first return on this point is he kind of did the double whammy to the serve and volleyer. That's one, you made him move off of this straight line. You made him move more of a diagonal here. He had to move more than he normally would if he just came straight in. And then two, you got that foot-to-knee contact height or zone. That makes it difficult for Ian to keep his ball down and for him to be aggressive with the ball because it's below the height of the net. All right, so now we're moving on to the next 3D analysis point, and we'll see what happens in this particular point. We see a couple things from Kevin here. Decent position as far as his proximity to the baseline, right? He's relatively close. He moves in, which I really like here. He's already moving diagonally forward to the ball. I don't like the fact that he's moving back here again off of that. So he moved in, right, initially, and then he kind of backs up a little bit here. I do like the fact, though, though, he took it a very high contact point, which can be uncomfortable, but he's trying to take Ian's time, and he's trying to put Ian in a bad position with his own contact height and positioning, right? So he takes the highest return that we've seen so far, probably just above his shoulder. He does a, you know, he hits a top spin return again. So he's going low to high here to contact this. And we can see he hits a very good dipping top spin ball already. We already see it. Really good job with the up down here. And again, forcing Ian to half volley from that foot to knee contact height. We also notice here for the first time as well, Ian has moved more for this ball, his total movement to this first strike. 31 feet than we've seen in any other point before this. This is the greatest distance he's had to move to make contact with the ball. Again, this is going to be extremely uncomfortable. The amount of movement that's taking place, the super low contact height, it should force him into a very tough situation. One thing I really like here about Kevin is he's anticipating a short ball already with his movement compared to where he was before. So we see Kevin at contact is here. In this area of the baseline, you can see his movement pattern here. Watch where he moves to as he realizes how good his return is. 
And now look where Kevin is, right? So Kevin went from this position here and he moved all the way up into here based on the quality of his return. Those cues and understanding those things of you know what you've done to your opponent in any situation is extremely important at every level of the game. That's something you can take away from this point and learn, and that's really valuable for your game. Let's see what happens as we move forward with Ian's shot here. He pops it up, maybe even got a bad bounce off that particular ball, but it was extremely difficult to begin with and is forced into an error. So now we're gonna look at the final 3D analysis point. And again, we got another one on the ad side. So let's see what happens with this point. I like Kevin's position to start. He's leaning forward. He's a little closer to the baseline. Let's see what he does. I really like the move that Kevin made here. So Kevin makes kind of the diagonal here. And this is the first time that we see Kevin making contact with the return. One really pretty much at that shoulder height, right? I think he had one earlier that was also there. But look at where he is. He's inside zone three, inside the baseline, and this is gonna make Ian's first volley very difficult, or first half volley, because Kevin's taking time with his position, and Ian's charging in. This should probably be pretty difficult. Let's see what happens. Kevin makes good contact, and he does. He's got a half volley here at his feet, and Kevin, recognizing that his return is really high quality, he's already running in. He felt that. He felt it from here how good the return was, and he starts charging in before Ian even hits the ball. We can see him charging in here, and Ian tries to thread the needle, and when Ian tries to thread the needle, and what I mean by that is Ian tried to hit this, this half volley low over the net to keep it down. Ian doesn't wanna pop this up and let Kevin get a sitting passing shot, so he's trying to thread it low, which is risky, especially because his feet are pretty close together, so the base isn't wide enough and his balance isn't as good as it should be. If his feet were a little wider, he could get down for this a little more and have a better chance at threading the needle over the net. He ends up popping it into the net and making the error, right? So during the course of this match, some of the things that we can see that are really important is that Kevin's court position played a huge role in this match and his ability to come back and win the second set where in the first set he had a lot of trouble, right? It wasn't just about his ground stroke game, it was about his positioning and his tactics. Kevin's playing deeper behind the baseline on that first return of serve and chipping the ball back from a low contact height. He's gonna float a lot more returns back up high that are easy sitters for Ian, and Ian's gonna pick those balls off and finish the points really easily. We're not trying to give that certain volleyer a very first easy volley. We're trying to improve our court position, dip it down at their feet, make them move left and right. And if you can put those two things together at the same time, the left to right movement, and also the dipping foot to knee contact, you put the serving volleyer in a really, really bad position where you're gonna be winning more points than they are. Just remember, we have released a full singles tactics course on tennisunleashed.net. So if you wanna see more exclusive information like this, please visit us there. We've done a study on the top male and female players in the world and gathered four years of statistics on the best of the best to show you what their patterns are and their tactics are in singles and how you can apply them to your own game. This is helpful for not just recreational players, it's actually helpful for professional players, college players, rec players, and every single level in between. As a coach, this information can be extremely helpful in teaching and developing your students on the court. It can give them an advantage anytime they play a competitive match or even a match just for fun. And always, if you like this video, smash that like and subscribe button. Also turn on your notification bell to be notified when new videos for TennisUnleashed.net come out. We will be doing more analysis like this, but moving forward, we're gonna do it with the pros. So make sure you do not miss that. I'm Jason Frosto for TennisUnleashed.net. We'll see you next time.